one. <clears throat> so Senate Government Operations, it is Tuesday, April 13th. And um, today we're going to be looking at the uh, proposal to upgrade the or reorganize the Department of Public Safety into the um, Agency of Public Safety. And hopefully everybody has been able to access. There is a new draft. Um, it is on our committee page. And I believe most people were um, sent a link by Gail. <laughs> and if I might, just before I ask Amarin to walk us through it, might just um, say how this new draft came apart or came about. <laughs> Last, I'm coming apart, just so you know. <laughs> Last um, week, as I started reading this closer and closer and closer, and, and I looked at the, um, the original uh, language and the language of what we had um, been looking at, and it said, talked about the creation of the um, consolidating the uh, resources of law enforcement. And, and it seemed to me that this was mostly about law enforcement. And that wasn't ever the intent of this. And I, I made sure that I understood that with um, Commissioner Sherling, that, that really the intent of this was to, to create an agency that encompassed emergency management, fire safety, and law enforcement, and, and elevated um, public safety, emergency management, and fire safety to the same level as um, law enforcement. And currently, the Department of Public Safety is so um, intricately uh, linked to the Vermont State Police because there is no reference in the in the statutes to the Vermont State Police. It's the department, and the commissioner is the top cop. So <laughs> we we wanted to. The intent always was to to ele to to get rid of that idea that the de the department was and the and Vermont State Police were the same thing. So by um, creating an agency, we were able to do that. But the way we had it um, worded and stuff seemed to me to fly in the face of that. So I just started going through it and started making uh, changes in the very beginning under the findings and under the creation of the agency. And then I said, no, this isn't right. So in the Senate, we do not like findings necessarily, <coughs> unless they're there in the eventuality that somebody in court needs to determine the intent of the legislation. And that's in, in our area, that's primarily around campaign finance. Why, what, what was the background that led you to have to put these restrictions on campaign donations? In this case, th there probably isn't a reason to, to um, do findings. So I completely removed the findings. And then I took out the, the creation paragraph and made up a new one. And so this really is a draft. Uh, Commissioner Sherling and I have gone through it. And so it makes some, it doesn't make a lot of technical changes, but it makes a lot of substantive changes. So um, if you will have Amarin walk us through this new draft, but does anybody have any questions first? Committee? Anybody else have any questions before we start? No. Okay. So know that this was done with the best of intentions and we'll go from here, okay? So Amarin, do you wanna walk us through this? Certainly, for the record, Amarin Abergele, Legislative Council. And I am looking at draft 2.4 of drafting request 21-0890. I have within this draft 
uh, used yellow highlight for any wording that has either been added or modified since the previous version that was posted last week. I believe that was version 1.3. <clears throat> so as Senator White mentioned, Senator White, did you want me to do anything other than walk through the, the substantive changes? Um, no, I don't think so. I think that where, where they stayed the same, um, you can, um, I think just, yeah, the substantive changes, that's okay. what I would do. But if people have questions about the rest of it, okay. Perfect. Uh, so as Senator White mentioned, there was previously a section one that had legislative findings. That section has been removed and the remaining sections have been renumbered. So moving down on to page two, section 6002, subsection A. This was a much lengthier uh, statement of purpose for creating the Agency of Public Safety. So this has been shortened um, and refocused to emphasize that this is for the coordination of all public safety resources, including reducing redundancies, increasing efficiencies, and standardizing policies, training, and data collection. Within the, the main structure of the agency has remained the same as in the previous draft. You'll see, however, that I've broken out within subdivision one, the Department of Fire Safety and Emergency Management to include a division of emergency management, the division of fire safety, and then an, um, an office of training. Within the Department of Law Enforcement, this still has the division of the Vermont State Police and the division of motor vehicle enforcement. There is also a standalone division of support services in subdivision three, and then a new um, office of community relations in subdivision four that also uh, reports directly to the agency and is not within either of the other two departments or the division of support services. Subsection C uh, was reworded, I believe. Um, mm -hmm. Rather than saying that all of these are attached to the agency, it is now to specify that the agencies shall provide administrative support to the following boards, commissions, and councils. You'll see in this draft, the Vermont Criminal Justice Council has been deleted from this list. In uh, section 6003, beginning on the bottom of page three and into page four, you'll see that subsection C and D were deleted from the previous draft. These were sections that discussed uh, the Vermont Criminal Justice Council and I believe the E911 board. The next revision is in section 6021, appointment and duties, mm -hmm. to specify that the secretary shall oversee and direct the activities of the Division of Support Services in the Office of Community Relations. The secretary shall supervise the commissioner of fire safety and emergency management and the commissioner of law enforcement. Moving down to page, bottom of page six, section 6052. This is mandatory duties of commissioners and directors. The commissioner may formulate, put into effect, alter, and repeal rules for the administration of the department. This wording was in the previous draft, but I eliminated uh, wording, or I deleted and moved, I should say, wording relating uh, to changing of ranks and grades to a different section of the bill, so that this section is a uh, more general description of duties of a commissioner, regardless of whether it's the commissioner of law enforcement or the commissioner of fire safety and emergency management. In section 6053 on page seven, these are all highlighted. However, for the most part, one through seven were all in the previous draft. Um, they were just further down in the list. Subsection A is now a more general description of permissive duties that would apply to both commissioners within the agency. Subsection B on page eight um, outlines some specifics as to the commissioner of the Department of Law Enforcement and his or her permissive duties. And this is where I moved the um, the ability to designate or change the rank or grade to be held by a member in accordance with rules. 
assign or transfer members within a division to serve at such stations and to perform such duties as the commissioner shall designate and determine what certified law enforcement officers other than state police officers shall give bonds and prescribe the conditions and amount. And then subsection C, uh, notwithstanding anything to the contrary, the divisions within the Department of Law Enforcement shall not be abolished or transferred, and members from different divisions of the Department of Law Enforcement shall not be reassigned or transferred outside their division unless the member requests the transfer and the commissioner approves the transfer. This language was in the prior draft, but it was uh, spaced out within several different areas. Section 6054, directors. You'll see on page nine, I removed subsection C and D. These sections were the sections that discussed the Vermont Criminal Justice Council and the E911 board. Um, I added that uh, the secretary shall appoint any other directors whose appointment is not otherwise governed by law. So for the E911 board, you'll see later within this, there is a description um, of how that director in the manner that that director would be appointed. Um, and again, the Vermont Criminal Justice Council uh, has been removed from this section. Uh, the change on in section 6083 on the bottom of page nine is a slight wording change. change. I wouldn't say that it has substantive effect. Um, and then I have added grant management to the list on page 10 of administrative functions. Section 6084 is a new section that would establish an office of community relations within the agency. Uh, it is to be administered by the deputy secretary of the agency and does not fall within either the Department of Law Enforcement or the Department of Fire Safety and Emergency Management. Uh, I have placeholders in for the functions on, at the top of page 11. And moving down to section four on page 12, some slight wording changes. The Secretary of Public Safety shall coordinate with the Secretary of Administration and the following commissioners and directors. Um, as necessary to enable the organizational modernization and most efficient operation of state law enforcement divisions and resources. For the statutory changes for the enhanced 911 board, as I mentioned previously, I deleted a section concerning uh, the, um, the control of the secretary over the E911 board or over the executive director. The executive director shall submit a budget to the secretary. This was in the previous draft in this place. I've moved what was previously above um, to say that the executive director shall not be under the direction and control of the secretary, except with regard to the budget and other administrative functions given to the director or the board by law. So again, not new, but it has been moved from earlier, from further up. Um, page 15, I noticed we were missing an and, so I put the and in. Uh, the following changes beginning on page 16, as Senator White mentioned, um, there with the shift towards uh, making this bill draft uh, I guess express the intent that this is an agency of public safety and not the elevation of a law enforcement agency. The previous version had many instances where the commissioner of public safety was changed into the secretary of public safety. You'll see the following yellow highlights where you see commissioner uh, that pre in the previous version said secretary. So now the uh, current fun functions of the commissioner of the Department of Public Safety would be served by the commissioner of the Department of Law Enforcement, not the secretary of the Agency of Public Service. So that is a change you will see here on uh, page 16, also into 17. Uh, this is, has to do with uh, the state police facilities and fees. And I'm scrolling down now through to section 12, organization of department by commissioner. Um, this previously was 
uh, the secretary of the Agency of Public Safety organizing. This has now been changed to the commissioner of law enforcement with the approval of the governor and the secretary shall organize and arrange the Department of Law Enforcement. And in the, let's see, the next change is down on, <clears throat> page 22 in section 14 with examinations, appointment, promotion, probation of certified law enforcement officers. Again, we have changed the, the previous version said secretary. This now is back to the commissioner of law enforcement. And we've added where certified law enforcement officer positions support the work of agencies or departments outside the agency of public safety, the commissioner shall consult the agencies or departments concerning the qualifications for the positions. Section 1912 at the bottom of page 22 has again changed uh, secretary to back to commissioner. And that is true also of the changes on page 23. For in 1913 uniforms and equipment, we've added the commissioner shall consult with agencies and departments which are supported by certified law enforcement officers assigned to the Department of Law Enforcement on the uniforms and equipment necessary for those positions. Again, some changes, what used to be, <clears throat> excuse me, used to be secretary or now commissioner. Moving into page 24, powers and immunities. This previously said the secretary of public safety, it now says the commissioner of law enforcement. In section 15, creation of state police advisory commission member duties. I kept these sections in, although Technically right now they do not change what is current law uh, because it does say commissioner, but I wanted to make sure that people could see what had changed from the previous draft. Previously, these were the, uh, the secretary and this would have the state police advisory commission advising on not only the state police, but the all certified law enforcement officers attached to the agency of public safety. I have reverted these changes back to the commissioner and with the state police advisory commission um, uh, providing advice and counsel on the Vermont state police only and not other certified law enforcement officers. And that is true also of section 1923, moving from page 25 into page 26. Section 18, on at the bottom of page 26 is a new section. Just to clarify, this uh, previously was the, the Secretary of Public Safety and then the Commissioners of Corrections, Motor Vehicles, Fish and Wildlife. I have changed this back to the Commissioners of Law Enforcement of Corrections of Motor Vehicles. So that would be the Commissioner on the Vermont Criminal Justice Council and not the Secretary of Public Safety. Um, I will need to redo conforming revisions now that we have sort of re-envisioned what is being changed to a secretary and what is remaining as a commissioner. So there's a placeholder in there for now. The reporting section uh, remains the same from page 27 to page 28. The effective dates have changed primarily because things have been drastically renumbered uh, with my deletion of several sections and then uh, but the intent remains the same in that uh, the bill takes effect upon passage, except that the, the sections relating to the creation of the agency and the conforming revisions necessary to create the agency would take effect on July 1st. And then any sections related to the um, E9, E911 board and the motor vehicle enforcement officers transition into the agency of public safety would take place on July 1st, 2022. Thank you. So I You're just, welcome. I'm going to just throw in one clarification here and then I'll ask if anybody has technical questions and then <clears throat> go on. <clears throat> it, it might seem like in many cases that the secretary's responsibilities were dramatically diminished and that the secretary may have been demoted here in many cases because originally it said that the secretary would <clears throat> supervise the 
uh, law enforcement would supervise the state police and law enforcement would had in making this truly a, an agency of public safety and not an agency of law enforcement, it was really necessary to make sure that the secretary is above all of these things and does not have direct, direct supervision of the Vermont State Police or the other law enforcement. That was the commissioner's role and the secretary, as long as <clears throat> the language was in there that we had previously, my thought was, well, if you're going to have the secretary um, directly supervising law enforcement, then that person really should be a, lo a law enforcement officer. But in my mind, the director or the secretary of the Agency of Public Safety does not <clears throat> need to be a law enforcement officer. It could come be someone who comes through um, emergency management. It could be Senator Collimore. I mean, it, it doesn't need to be somebody who is a certified law enforcement officer to be the secretary. And just as, for example, Mike Smith, Secretary Smith does not um, <clears throat> directly supervise the employees in the Department of Mental Health, the commissioner does that. So that's, that's why all these changes back to commissioner from secretary. So although it might seem like um, <clears throat> the secretary won't have anything to do, I'm sure that he or she will. So committee, any technical correct or question? Yes, Senator Colomar. Thank you, Madam Chair. <laughs> I don't know that it's a technical question and I, Trust me, I was paying attention. Mm -hmm. um, I'm still a little confused if I go, I'm on page 25, just looking at the top there. So there's created the State Police Advisory Commission, which shall provide advice and counsel to the commissioner in carrying out his or her responsibilities of management, supervision, and control of the state police. Mm -hmm. Am I missing the section where the commissioner also has charge of other law enforcement agencies? No, this is <clears throat> the... It, it is in the far, um, a little bit earlier, and Amarin can um, speak to that, but this is just for the State Police Advisory Commission, saying the State Police Advisory Commission does not oversee or investigate other law enforcement uh, officers within the agency, those with DMV, Fish and Wildlife, DLC, whoever they are. <clears throat> this Thank is you. specific to the... State Police Advisory. I Commission. got it now. Thank is you. That, is that right, Amron? That's correct. Okay. So, any other <clears throat> questions for Amron about this? And then, then I think what I'd like to do is, I still have two lingering questions, and I that I think need to be resolved in my own mind, and that is about uh, by removing the uh, training not the training council, the council from here, which I, <clears throat> instead of uh, just saying that it's independent, just by removing it entirely, does that also remove the academy? That, so I think we, that's, that's a lingering question in my mind. But if there aren't any other questions right now, I would just jump right to Commissioner Sherling, I guess, and <clears throat> just ask you to weigh in on, on this draft. General. Good afternoon, Madam Chair. Thanks for uh, having me in and for all the work on this over the last few days. And thanks to Amarin for uh, really hammering out a, a bunch of substantive uh, changes that I think do bring this in a, a good direction. Um, for the record, uh, Mike Sherling, Commissioner of Public Safety. Um, we're supportive of this uh, direction. Um, the uh, the edits that have been made um, uh, in a direction that um, in some cases I thought would actually occur uh, more iteratively over time. So the the move to um, empower the commissioner of uh, law enforcement to have a more direct role. Uh, initially, the drafting was done uh, for simplicity to just transfer the initial duties of the uh, of the current commissioner of public safety to the secretary of public safety. Uh, with a, uh, the idea that uh, one of the reports back that would come in the future would outline sort of how to uh, divvy out various things. But this 
um, accelerates that work uh, in a way that we envision would happen at some point down the road. Um, removing the Criminal Justice Training Council at this stage just seems like uh, the most logical thing to do. Uh, I think uh, Chair Sorrell observed uh, as well in some correspondence that um, it's been watered down uh, so substantially that just providing administrative support, it just didn't seem to make sense to, to keep a whole lot of complex language that creates more questions than answers. Um, so doing that seemed to make sense. Um, I did send uh, an, an email just a, a few minutes ago. There's just one structural piece that, that got lost in the wash over the, in the haste in the last uh, day or, or just this morning, actually. Uh, the division of support services is actually um, supposed to be in tandem with uh, Department of Law Enforcement, the Department of Fire Safety, and um, uh, Emergency Management. And then the division of support services sits parallel to that. Uh, in the construct that we envisioned, um, supervised by a, a deputy secretary, uh, to elevate those support services to uh, ensure clarity that they weren't subsumed by either law enforcement or fire safety and emergency management. So that's one organizational component. Uh, and, and the only comment I have at the moment in terms of edits, we will have to take the next uh, 24 hours or so and just um, have our legal team go through and, and make sure um, we haven't inadvertently uh, broken anything in terms of the what would normally be a, a duty of a secretary of an agency or the, the um, well, yeah that's that's about it um, so I was just about to fire off that uh, that email in a moment but uh, beyond that I think this is you know overall this is a good uh, step. Uh, toward what has been discussed for literally 51 years at this point um, uh, without trying to throw everything in the kitchen sink in there and make it a really complicated transition. Thank you. And I, <clears throat> I was very neglectful in thanking um, Amarin for, <clears throat> she just, my brain doesn't work very fast sometimes. And so I didn't even get this to her until Friday af late afternoon and all these changes. And, and then uh, the commissioner and I met this morning or yesterday morning. So she has been working feverishly to get this to us. And I, I really need to thank you. You're very welcome. Thank you. <clears throat> so committee, any other um, questions or observations or um, Anything, does this seem the right direction? Did you like it better before when, did you like it better before? Is this the right direction? What? I think what this is a good improvement. I think your work, I think you've done great work rethinking this. Thank you, all of you who put in this extra time on it. So Senator yeah. Pauline, I saw you. Yeah. you well, I don't have anything, I don't have any great wisdom to share. I agree with what Senator Clarkson just said. I think it's a better direction. It seems more clear. I think it takes away the feeling that we're building a super, super um, police agency kind of thing. And my understanding is that the training council is now continues to be totally separate from what we're talking about. Is that correct? The training, <coughs> yes. The training yes. council is sort of on its own. It's, it's, it, before we were trying to put in language to assure that it was independent and autonomous and it just got very very messy and kind of it looked like it was kind of working backwards right and, so instead um, of trying to do language to make it seem independent we just kept it independent right right and so the only question i have that about that is how does that affect where the academy lies and gets its administrative support <clears throat> because the council is Although it, it is kind of the overseer of the academy, it isn't the academy itself. And so that, that's just something in my mind that I need to work out. So, okay, Brian, Senator Colmore, did you have? Yeah, I, I just wanted to agree with the, the rest of the committee. I think it's a, an improvement. It seems much more focused on what the uh, original intent was, which was, in my view, one of efficiency and uh, I guess just efficiency is a good, good way to put it. And I like that it's shorter. When bills get to be 40 and 50 pages, they uh, 
they tend to really uh, get confusing for me. So this is, what is it, 28 pages, I think. Uh, this is a, a great improvement. Thank you. I, I just I just felt so strong that what it sounded like we're like Senator Polina said that what we were creating was a <clears throat> super police agency and that was never the intent, but that is the way that was the perception. So, okay, Senator Clarkson. Yeah, I, I do have concerns about uh, leveraging, well, enabling or supplying enough resource for the council and the academy. So I, 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 the the one plus of of the of their being under the umbrella of the agency was that they would have shared that would have been an efficient use of of resources. I do have concerns that, however, we keep them independent, that we uh, supply them with enough resources to be independent. <clears throat> yeah, and I think that we'll hear from um, Bill Sorrell around that issue and where they. <clears throat> where they get their resources from. And I'd also like to hear him address the issue of the academy then and where it lives. Right. But so, um, yeah. so um, so I guess right now is the time to go to you, uh, Mr. Sorrell, and find out what you have to say to us. Thank you, Senator. Uh, I'd <clears throat> like to join Commissioner Sherling and the committee members who have spoken already to this issue by saying that uh, this draft is uh, is is an improvement, shows real progress, I believe. And uh, for myself personally, over the past week after your committee's hearing last week and questions from, as I recall, uh, Senators Rahm and Polina and other statements by committee members, I, I came to the conclusion that simply removing the council from the draft was the simplest and most direct way to reflect the independence of the council and to avoid <coughs> the, the questions put, uh, put to me last week of, well, aren't you concerned about uh, appearances of a lack of independence when you're tied in for the administrative services and such? So uh, I think uh, that, that makes, I, I think this is a real improvement. In answer to your question, uh, and I've spoken to our new executive director, Heather Simons, who started work yesterday uh, in hey. uh, the other upper echelon of the, <coughs> of the academy staff. And uh, it's, I think it's our view that we have been conducting or taking care at the academy of our own administrative needs. And S-124, you know, creating the new Criminal Justice Council and with many extra duties and consequently we've only been up and running since essentially the 1st of January, many new subcommittees and obligations on council members and others and what really sort of remains to be seen is whether the structure that we've had within the academy, how stressed is the relatively small academy uh, staff of a dozen or so by these new duties and responsibilities. And so I think uh, rather than sort of muddy the waters, uh, no slight intended with this in the agency for the administrative services, but not otherwise and whatever, is that uh, the better course at this juncture is to let us continue to essentially do a status quo functioning of the academy as a separate ent entity uh, out there maybe is a, a, d a descriptor, but as we, that is in the council and the new executive director and uh, the rest of the hierarchy of the academy sees how things evolve under S-124 with the new council. If we see uh, some real shortcomings administ in administrative services or, or functions or others, uh, trust me, we will be back before your committee and the House committee uh, come, come, next, come next January. 
I will say on the budgeting side of things, uh, and I think Commissioner Sherman, I know he agrees that the functioning of the academy has been underfunded historically. Uh, now with the new duties, that sort of underfunding uh, uh, is exacerbated, if you will. But uh, thus far, we'll see what comes out of Senate appropriations now and what the ultimate uh, uh, Appropriations Act looks like, but there's grounds for some optimism that we are going to have uh, a, couple of, a couple of authorized positions to meet critical needs and quite potentially uh, uh, Thanks to Senator Sears, uh, 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 maybe uh, some monies to assist us on meeting various of our duties. So we are at least as we currently sit, sitting much more favorably resources wise than we were in the governor's recommended budget. So. We're keeping our, our fingers crossed there. Uh, on the draft, just a couple of uh, observations. Uh, in the, uh, the, the new draft uh, on page 12, uh, section four, the transition section, it talks about uh, that the secretary would consult with the executive director, uh, of the uh, training council and the chair. And uh, speaking for myself, I have no objection to being consulted, but I'm wondering since the, the council uh, and the academy in this draft are out, whether uh, that needs to be in there, or whether that should be deleted. That's over on page 12. But again, if, uh, uh, if the committee thinks the, there should be consultation with Heather Simons and myself. Uh, all, all good with, uh, all good with that. And then one other just question that came to me as Amarin was going through this improved draft was over on page 22, the section 1911, uh, and uh, it it talks about the. Um, uh, and this is just for my own clarification. It talks about uh, the commissioner devising and administering examinations designed to test the qualifications of applicants, et cetera, uh, for, uh, state, uh, for certified law enforcement assigned to the department. Uh, and I, I understand this because police departments are certainly able to have their own sort of qualifying exams to even uh, become a member of the Wyndham County Sheriff's Department or the Middlebury Police Department, et cetera. I'm just assuming that this language is that for the law enforcement officers uh, uh, to be within this new agency, both state police and others, that you can have your same standards, but this does not mean that those are lesser standards than set by the Criminal Justice Council for admission to and training at the academy. Uh, uh, that this isn't trying to change that, uh, uh, what has historically been the case. The council determines uh, the qualifying uh, exam or personality exams, sets the curriculum, determines whether John Doe or Jane Smith and Jane Smith have successfully completed the curriculum at the academy, but then state police or other law enforcement assigned to the, this agency uh, can have additional requirements or obligations in excess, but not less than the baseline standards set by the council. I'm assuming I, I, that. I think that that is the case. I think that they would still have to become a certified law enforcement officer through the academy. Yes. And then the state police, I know, have have some requirements beyond. Yes, that. they do. And yeah. Fish and Wildlife or DMV 
might have um, requirements that uh, I don't, I, I'm thinking of fish and wildlife, for example, that they, they might have uh, certain um, qualifications that you need to, to meet to be working in the woods and to exactly. be able to tell a, a bear from a, a chicken or what, whatever. <laughs> and DMV might have the same thing because they do a lot yes. of um, uh, truck enforcement and stuff. So they might yeah, yep. yeah, it's it's over and above. It's for those positions. Yep, but not... that that that's what I assume. But I just wanted to get it on the record for yep. legislative history purposes that that's what you intend. It's certainly the way I would uh, hope it would be interpreted. But well, uh, and that's yeah. that is current law. We're just yeah. adding yes. other law. So yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So, uh, but let me summarize just by saying th thank you to the committee for the changes that have been made and. Uh, uh, we look forward to the rest, rest of the process, but uh, thank you for hearing us. Thank you. And I just want to check with the commissioner to make sure I was correct on my response about the additional training. Absolutely, Madam Chair. Um, that language exists uh, in, now in the, uh, the organizational statute for the Department of Public Safety. It, it may be altered, a, a touch, but... Uh, the intent is the same to set standards beyond what the base standard is for entrance to the academy and certification. Good. <clears throat> Thank you. Any questions, committee, so far? So I think what I'm going to do right now is go. Um, in the last uh, time, I think we ran out of time and didn't really get time to hear from um, John Federico. And I do see you're here, although. It does a little bit look like you're in witness protection again, you, um, but we, I can tell that it's you because of your um, vehicle behind you. So uh, we did run out of time last time and didn't get a chance to hear from you. So if you would just uh, give some comments on this new draft and are we moving in the right direction or are you still have concerns? Just. Tell us what you think. Thank you, Madam Chair. I can, I certainly will tell you what I think. I know um, you will. <laughs> uh, I tried to lighten up the background so I wouldn't look like I was on channel. No, three it's okay. It's, it's my identity. Um, for the record, John Federico, I'm an employee of the Department of Motor Vehicles Enforcement and Safety Division. Um, the agenda shows that I'm a VSEA Board of Trustee member. So I'm a former VSEA Board of Trustee member. Um, I'm still on the council and active there, and I'm the law enforcement um, uh, representative uh, for VSEA to the law enforcement, uh, uh, excuse me, the LEAB and the Vermont Criminal Justice Council uh, currently. Um, as you may or may not know, VSEA represents uh, certified law enforcement officers employed by the state who are not state police. Uh, who are represented by the, as you know, the Vermont Troopers Association, although we uh, represent the lieutenants uh, in the supervisory union in, in VSEA, we represent a, just north of 100 uh, sworn law enforcement officers in the state. Uh, the, the, you know, the bulk of which are liquor controlled, uh, fish and wildlife, uh, motor vehicles, uh, but we have some attorney generals, investigators, medical board and practice investigators, uh, secretary of state uh, investigators, um, the, uh, the department at the, at the uh, state capitol. Um, and I hope I'm not missing anybody. Um, so we, I testified before the House Government Ops Committee and I think we'll, I'll testify similarly today that um, you know, we uh, sent out a survey to our members uh, we had about 70 respondents. It was back in the fall, I believe. Um, we had an inkling that the uh, legislature uh, uh, might take this up this year. Um, and 87% of the respondents in the survey um, were, were against the move to consolidate um, to an agency, to the same agency. Um, so I understand a lot of the, the discussion about um, the executive order. Now this bill has been um, around um, Vermont um, Justice Council, and and certainly it's understandable. Um, 
But I, I and, and it's a, a new revelation that we're going to sort of change directions, it seems, on, on that. And, um, but I would have testified regardless uh, of whether or not you feel it's appropriate for all the other components uh, of an agency of public safety uh, to be uh, within the agency of public safety that, uh, that it's our belief, the rank and file's belief that, um, uh, that it's not a good idea to consolidate all the other law enforcement uh, agencies under the same roof. Um, we didn't parse out in that study everybody's individual ideas of, of why they were against it and why they thought it was a bad idea. Um, and certainly we can, we can get further um, studies done and surveys done and, and get that uh, level of granularity uh, if it's of interest to uh, any of the legislative committees. Um, but suffice it to say that uh, a lot of our discussions have been around the fact that um, we're, uh, we're concerned over um, our, the level of specialization and specificity in our missions um, that that those things will um, will somehow be compromised or changed to a degree that um, they will uh, look uh, a lot different than they look today, uh, and that's going to affect not only um, the, the the positions uh, and the work uh, of our of our members, but also uh, the way that we deliver those services to um, the state. And I understand that the that the that the whole point of this is to try and deliver the best service that we can to the citizens of Vermont. And, uh, and I certainly uh, applaud that. Um, we just don't know, we just don't believe overwhelmingly that this is the way to do it. Um, a lot of these efficiencies, a lot of these economies of service, I think we, you know, we can get done today uh, without the expense of creating this um, this sort of uh, of, uh, of an agency, or at least the Department of Law Enforcement within this agency, um, you know, the the state has many different ways that um, that we can uh, achieve these economies of scale, these these training, um, and these policies and that sort of thing, um, and uh, and and. So to my knowledge, none of that has changed uh, since the beginning uh, uh, of this discussion, uh, back when the legislators started back in session. Um, I, I can't comment specifically, uh, uh, necessarily, uh, Madam Chair, about the specifics in the bill, um, except that it it confirms most of you know what people would fear would be you know a complete um, uh, ability to change. Um, um, you know their current uh, their current work conditions their um, their current mission and, uh, and 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 again a lot of the unknown um, uh, goes along with it. So um, you know if if we if we were to go um, through with um, a change like this, I think, you know, would be sort of a, almost a full surrender on on the particulars in a in the legislation or, or of the bill. Um, at, at that point, I think we would just, um, you know, work the best we could at at uh, trying to uh, uh, work out the particulars on the other side of things. But um, but there's an, enough unknowns and enough uh, uh, um, complication, I think, uh, that we would all foresee that. Uh, we suggest to you that that we believe that this isn't the best way to to go about handling the services that we now provide to the citizens of Vermont. So can I I'll stop there? I'll I, stop just, there and try to answer okay. any questions that you have. Okay, because I have a couple of them. So first of all, I'm I don't know if you are opposed to the concept of an agency of public safety that um, in in my mind, one of the reasons for it is to to elevate the Department of uh, um, Emergency Management and Fire Safety to the same level as the Department of Law Enforcement. So in my mind, that's just a reorganization, but it's also changing it from being what is commonly seen as a law enforcement de department to a public safety agency. So I don't know if you're opposed to the concept of an agency or if you're opposed 
to being part of it. Okay, absolutely. Uh, we're not opposed to the concept of an agency of public safety uh, at all, it, to the extent that uh, you, everyone believes and can be shown that uh, that uh, all those components make sense to be under the, the roof. I think that's uh, absolutely um, uh, something to consider. Our, our specific um, ask is that, is that the agency of public safety doesn't need a department of law enforcement. The department of law enforcement with all of the specialized units in the state under the same roof, um, uh, we believe um, will be a, a confusing and expensive proposition and, and change the specialization uh, that we have today that you know has been built over many years. Um, the, um, the, the, the inner workings of our, of our current agencies and departments um, took years to build and, and, uh, and, and uh, we think that, that changing that will be detrimental to the mission that we have. So I guess I need a little bit more clarification. So the way it's structured is that there would be an agency of public safety and there would be a department of law enforcement and a Department of Emergency Management and Fire Safety. If you didn't have a Department of Law Enforcement, then that leaves the same relationship to the Secretary and the Agency of Law Enforcement. So are you saying that you don't need a, a, a Department of Law Enforcement under the agency or that you shouldn't be part of that department? I, I, I understand that organizationally, you may need two divisions in order to have one department. Um, so I, I don't know what you would do with the state police as a division alone, standing within the agency of public safety, but I, I, we would have no problem with that. Uh, we just don't think it's a good idea to incorporate fishing game, liquor control, okay. whoever else in a division within the agency of public safety. Along, okay. alongside that group. That, that, that I think is answering my question that you, you don't have any necessary opposition to this reorganization, but you don't want to be part of it. Correct. Okay, right. Any questions from committee members uh, for John? I would like to, um, if you could, Give some examples of, and not necessarily today, but of how you think it would um, change the way you deliver your services and your, and change your mission. Because my understanding is that the way it would be defined here is that the you would still be assigned to DMV. I mean, you'd be or Fish and Wildlife, and that that would be your that would be your mission. You you wouldn't wear the same uniform as the troopers and you wouldn't wear the same uniform as the fish and wildlife, the game wardens. So I, I guess I, I need some more concrete thoughts about how it would, how it would um, change your mission and um, their, your services. Well, the, the problem I think in, in, in most people's minds is the unknown. And the, and the fact that, you know, uh, essentially we're, we're not going over there to exactly be the same. I mean, the point uh, of going over there seems to be to run things differently, to run things in a way that to someone else makes more sense efficiently uh, to, uh, and, and with all those unknowns, I guess it, in people's minds, um, they can't be sure of the extent of how things would change. And, um, uh, and so they, they, it's certainly difficult to get behind uh, uh, that sort of, uh, um, this, this sort of change without, without knowing a lot more specificity. Um, you know, we, there's, there's gonna be a lot of practical considerations like um, the fact that, um, we already do things very differently from one another. Um, again, as you know, we, we are we're under an entirely different um, contract uh, and, and bargaining unit than the state police are. Um, but we would be 
nestled under the same department as them. And so there would be a, a lot of, a lot of uh, I think, difficulty going back and forth with the way that, that we do things to run things necessarily the same way. Um, I think I've just been thinking about, you know, the, uh, and I, I thought about these things uh, when we testified for the house is, you know, if, if there's efficiencies in training, if there's efficiencies in, in buying things uh, and, and those sorts of things, I mean, the state has statewide contracts. Um, there's, there's never been any barriers to training together. Um, uh, certainly there, um, uh, you know, if some of our policies were so different from one another that um, those things can be addressed. Um, without such severe changes, um, and, and I and I wonder um, if some people have the belief that um, that uh, you know we need to we need to streamline some of those things. Uh, I, I wonder if they're thinking in terms of today's um, what, what law enforcement is going through today uh, in terms of changes and and uh, in review. Um, I, I would argue that we don't need to squish these different agencies together in order to achieve that. And, and if we did, how would we expect um, the changes that the legislature is, is hoping that all of law enforcement in the state is going to make? Because we're certainly not talking about squishing Burlington together with Springfield PD and, and those sorts of things in order to achieve what the uh, legislature overall wants to do uh, with law enforcement in terms of uh, today's um, today's review. Um, uh, so these are things that that you know we should be able to achieve separately, just as any other law enforcement agency in the state should be able to achieve. Um, so I don't know if that answered your question, Madam Chair. But yeah, I mean, I, I see the I see that there is a great fear of the unknown, and I appreciate that. I. Um, I think I, I see uh, Commissioner Sherling's hand up. I don't know if you had a response to that or a, a comment. I do, Madam Chair, thank you. Um, I, I just direct the committee to the uh, roughly 23 studies that have occurred over the last 51 years, um, all of which come to the same conclusion that the state's efforts at public safety are over fragmented um, and are duplicating effort in a number of ways. And this move to the agency and a reorganization of assets, while it is not in any way designed to diminish the role uh, and the core duties of the various, speaking just of the law enforcement agencies, because that's um, what we're talking about right now, um, there are tremendous efficiencies um, and reductions and duplication of effort that can be achieved over time from buying equipment, the nature of our facilities, the security at those facilities, the nature of um, how many people need to be up to speed on uh, supervising and leading police agencies, uh, policy development, um, and that list just goes on and on and on. And the studies that we reviewed in order to get to this point, um, again, all uh, have come to the same conclusion, and they've been launched by the executive branch, the legislature, independent bodies, uh, think tanks, etc. cetera. Um, so the evidence is overwhelming that there is uh, there are benefits to be uh, achieved here operationally, and most importantly, in, in service delivery uh, to Vermonters statewide. I, Madam Chair, can I respond? Sure, sure. Thanks. Uh, one of the things I would say about the studies is that um, is that the last one, one that I think that we're contending with was 2009, which I believe is old by any standards. Um, and certainly law enforcement modernization has taken on a whole new meaning just in the last year um, that's been completely uh, different than anything that would have been contemplated in 2009. Um, not that I'm arguing for any new studies um, at all, um, not without specific uh, need and effect. Um, but, you know, I think part of that 2009 study, uh, just for example, um, even recommended, uh, you know, one of the things that was accomplished that was recommended was the, the state police shedding some of the specialization, um, which ended up happening after the 2009 study and 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 uh and we took on all of the you know most if not all of the commercial vehicle enforcement duties 
Um, so I, I, I think that, um, I think it's a laudable goal um, to, you know, to have um, modernization and that sort of thing. But again, I would, I would say that we should, we sh we can and should be able to achieve these things while while preserving uh, the individual missions, um, and still working together side by side under the state umbrella. Uh, we just don't have to do that within the same agency. And um, again, if we expect some of the changes that the legislature makes for law enforcement in general in Vermont um, to be able to take hold in all law enforcement agencies, um, there should be no problem um, in order uh, achieving that um, with us staying within the Department of Motor Vehicles and, and Fish and Game staying with, within their department, et cetera. Okay, any questions for John or um, the commissioner? I think this is, yes, Senator Rahm. Well, I'm, I'm sorry to be late. I'm dealing with a lot of sort of medical stuff that is the, my medical provider calling me back. But um, so apologies if, if this was already discussed. Um, I came in hearing um, Commissioner Sherling talking about, you know, studies have shown that this is an effective way to modernize. I'm really wondering in a 24 hour period that's been particularly, has poured a lot of salt into the wounds of black and brown Vermonters around their experience with police, how you expect that this will increase accountability for law enforcement. I don't think that people are asking for modernization as much as they're asking for accountability. So I, I'm going to take a stab at this because this, this reorganization does not address the issues that currently exist in what we, the, the issues that we see in law enforcement. It doesn't address those at all, except to set up a new office of community relations. So I other disagree than- disagree with that proposal entirely. I don't disagree? think community relations is accountability. What? Community relations is an accountability. I'd, I'd really like to hear the, the commissioner answer the question, Madam Chair. Okay, all right. Thank you, Senator. Uh, it is a great question. Um, right now we have uh, disparate ways of supervising. We have disparate policy. Um, we have disparate equipment. Uh, in some cases, there's disparate training. And um, what both the historic studies and the current um, modernization strategy, I also direct the committee to th this being one piece of a larger modernization construct that we put forth last uh, January that we're, we're well on our way to uh, achieving uh, large components of right now. Um, the idea is to unify as much as possible all of that. So Vermonters are not getting um, the disparity in those various operate in those various operational lanes. Um, what, are, uh, what are the five? What are what are five metrics that you could turn around? For example, you know, young black men make up two and a half percent of Chittenden County's population, and twenty five percent of those charged as youthful offenders. Do you see a way that this change would turn those figures around? Would in, in any way impact? disparities that we see right now that are huge and growing in the state? The, uh, the initial answer to that is that um, a lot of the work that has been done statewide in uh, fair and impartial policing has, done, has been done in an office that is exclusive to the state police. So the idea here is to broaden that level of nuanced work across all of state law enforcement and even beyond. And one of the things that would happen as a result of creating the agency is uh, the kind of specialization that John was talking about that spun off of the 2009 study could continue to occur and, and even become uh, more broadly impactful uh, as you add uh, these resources together so that um, not only do they get the benefit of the work of the fair and impartial policing team, which is co-led by uh, a civilian, um, but also uh, get the benefit of the policy development and all of the experience that comes with that. So that's, the, that's sort of the tip of the iceberg in terms of improving those kinds of operations on a statewide basis. Have you seen this kind of change have those impacts in other states? What, what, what specifically have you seen have an impact 
most other states don't have this level of fragmentation that we have. Um, Vermont has historically been uh, sort of this organic local control kind of environment, and we tend to add things in tandem with other things rather than bring things together. So it's hard to make comparisons to other states. So I, I guess, oh, Senator Colomar. Thank you, Madam Chair. So John, I'm, I'm sympathetic in, in many ways with what you outlined here. And I have heard from other uh, members of the BSEA that have concerns about the proposed reorganization, but I'm still trying to just get a sense and I don't mean to put you on the spot, John, I really don't. When you, if, if this were to happen, if the reorganization were to go through, when you get up in the morning and get in the truck, what will change for you if things are, are, are in the alignment that we're suggesting they be? Is it a, is it a, a top-down um, fear that you have in terms of who's going to supervise you? Or are there specific examples that you can give uh, 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 what, what is it that, that they are most worried about? I, and I know you said the unknown, and I, trust me, I understand that too, but I'm just, I guess, still looking for uh, an opportunity for you to kind of pencil in the, the concerns that you have. Sure, Senator. Um, it, it is difficult to say because, you know, uh, tomorrow nothing would change. I, you know, our folks would still be doing exactly the same thing in exactly the same way. And for how long, I have no idea. Uh, all I know is that anything and everything, you know, would be subject to change. Um, I think one of the House representatives um, colorfully put it that, uh, you know, he's been through many mergers and that sort of thing before where they promised that the only thing would change is the color of the check of your paycheck or something. Um, but uh, it's, it's so unknown that, that uh, we, we couldn't say, we absolutely couldn't say. For us, for us in particular, I, I guess, um, let me throw out there that, um, you know, just, just being under the same roof, for instance, um, we would no longer be um, making um, our, own in, our own interdepartmental uh, decisions uh, on who we hire. Um, you know, that that would, again, come from, you know, the, the organizational chart that I've seen, we would go through a commissioner, we do that, you know, we do that now, a director, a commissioner, and, and, a, and a secretary, we do that now, but that secretary would, uh, and commissioner would also be over um, the other agencies, uh, state police, um, eventually fish and game, liquor control. So while that wouldn't necessarily affect decisions, um, uh, you know, made by by um, outside law enforcement uh, coming in, um, those transfers from within law enforcement uh, within the state would be um, no longer uh, under our own purview in terms of who we thought would be a good fit for the missions that we have. Um, mm -hmm. So, um, so that could change uh, just just our recruitment uh, going forward. Um, in our ability to maintain um, uh, our ranks as we do today. Um, I, the rest is so unknown, I, I, I can't tell you. I mean, we had, a, we had um, uh, the, in the Truck and Bus Association come in and, uh, and, and sort of uh, testify on our behalf that, you know, uh, again, we'd uh, done a, 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 an excellent job over the years of, of uh, professionalizing our services um, uh, and, uh, um, and, and they would hope that they wouldn't see much of that change. And I can't promise them in any way, shape or form, um, uh, how, how any changes might, might affect them slowly or, or, uh, quickly. Okay. Actually, I think it was me that brought up that, uh, comparison that, uh, I've been through, uh, four or five owners of radio stations I've been involved with and, you know, the worst thing you hear when somebody new buys it is, Nothing's going to change. Everything's going to be the same. And you know darn well that that's probably not going to happen or they wouldn't have bought it to begin with. So I'm very sympathetic with what you're saying. But again, I was just trying to get a specific example of what might change for the average DMV enforcement person. Um, and I have to say, I mean, this could all get changed with a statute too. 
we could decide at some point to, to pull your department out and do something else with it. But so I can, I can understand the independence that you feel now that you might be surrendering to some extent. But I think that's true for a lot of the different divisions that, that possibly could be affected. So I don't know how to assuage your, uh, you know, uh, yeah, absolutely. It's not that we're not without um, change. I mean, even in the time that I've been with DMV, which hasn't been long, uh, about seven years, uh, I've already seen change. And that change can happen with the appointment of uh, the election of different governors, the appointment of different secretaries and commissioners. Uh, and we've and I've seen that in just in my short uh, span uh, of being here, uh, where wherein we've been uh, more actively engaged in um, highway safety, uh, general highway safety, uh, than than very specific uh, focus on commercial uh, commercial trucking and how that affects highway safety. Uh, so we've we've definitely broadened in the time uh, in the time I've been here. Uh, you know, you can see uh, behind me a specific example is uh, the addition of police on the bottom of the car used to say uh, something different and, and, you know, small little change, no big deal. Um, still doesn't prevent people from not even recognizing us and driving by us at like 80 miles an hour, you know, but um, uh, it, uh, um, some of the impacts uh, ultimately down the road uh, will be, uh, you know, um, will be um, just, I suppose, more individual on working conditions. And ultimately, you know, we hope that um, uh, that it wouldn't change uh, the specific mission and the focus and the energy that we have on that mission uh, into too many different directions. Um, because having that focus and having that ability to focus on that specific thing, um, rather than a wide variety of things, really, uh, really does help um, uh, deliver the best service we can within our focus to to the citizens of Vermont. Well, I hope things do go well for you, John, if this goes through and, you know, it could get better too, right? So I, I, I'm just, I'm not, I'm not seeing the, the, the cost benefit for us okay. at this point. All right. Thank you, John. So I see the commissioner has his hand up. Thanks. Uh, I, I couldn't agree more with, uh, with John that um, ensuring that the specificity with which um, the, the enforcement team can uh, operates is essential to maintain it. And that's one of the reasons that uh, this was framed the way it was. And um, uh, we would want to ensure that whatever language passes, at least from our perspective, uh, memorializes that for the long term. Um, I did also want to speak to the, the hiring example uh, and I've worked in two um, state agencies at this point, both commerce and public safety. And uh, I can't imagine anything changing um, relative to hiring. Division directors do hiring within their divisions. Uh, Director Facos does that now uh, for DMV enforcement. Um, that would be the same in an agency of public safety in the same way that the division directors do that at the agency of commerce and throughout the Department of Public Safety. Um, as a commissioner, I'm not involved in hiring decisions for uh, Director Borneman, uh, um, Director DeRocher in fire safety, um, uh, even in VCIC where uh, it's more of a unit than a full division. Um, Director Wallen has full autonomy over who gets hired there. I just do the final sign off. So I, we can't imagine that kind of thing would be changing as that's the way it operates throughout the state enterprise. The difference that I would see here would be that it's a becomes a transfer and not a not a hiring decision per se. Um, imagine the the I can't I can't imagine the pressure, um, you know, that state police are under currently, uh, and and in the future somebody doesn't uh, apply to us to leave there and get hired at our place. They have to apply for a transfer to a different division. And if the pressure is that, you know, we can't afford to lose any more troopers to that side of the house, then, you know, I'm sorry, you can't go over there right now. Uh, that sort of thing. So subtle differences like that is what I was talking about. Yeah, in one respect, the, the, the statutory framework um, that's proposed here ensures that someone couldn't be 
uh, forced to go from one division to another. But John is is right. Uh, movement from one to the other. Um, I'm not sure how exactly that would play out. I can't imagine the scenario that um, was just given coming to pass. But uh, then again, I won't be here forever. So um, uh, and that part is not contemplated in the statutory framework. Okay. Um, yes, Senator Rahm. I, I thought I saw Senator Kalina's hand, but maybe. Oh, I, I did not. I missed that. Thank you. Well, I, I did have my hand up, but I, I fear that we're going to start getting redundant in this conversation. I, I wanted to tell John that I appreciate what he's talking about. And I think what we're talking, what he's talking about, what I'm hearing, let's put it that way, is there's concerns about kind of chain of command and decision making and priority setting and maybe resource allocation, which, which could be a result of the, of the merger or the expansion of the agency of public safety. And I, I mean, I don't know what, how to solve that concern other than to not let it happen, but I just think that's what I'm hearing is that it's hard to put a finger on it because it hasn't happened yet, but there's concerns about being subsumed in a larger agency and losing your ability to make your own decisions and set your own priorities. So I, I, I understand what he's saying. I'm just not sure what to do about it, quite honestly. Those are, those are all correct, uh, Senator. Uh, but there's also just the, the fact that I think, uh, considering the, uh, you know, we, we believe that we all deliver excellent service today. We, we, we know that that can be improved all the time. Um, change can occur within the silos that we're in today. Um, these, um, I, I just feel strongly that these efficiencies can be done without major restructuring and without major uh, additional cost to the state uh, in order to do that. Um, so I would, I would add that. Sure, thank you. Thanks. Um, Senator Rahm, did you have a question? Yeah, I don't know if Commissioner Sherling has his hand up for that. Oh, I think it might still be up from, but. Yeah, I just forgot to take it down, it's yeah. fixed. Okay, so Commissioner Sherling, I was just curious, um, what would you articulate as the value proposition to this merger for communities that have been impacted by police violence and disproportionate incarceration? Uh, the primary value pop proposition is that it will enable the acceleration of change. What if they are not, what if they're concerned about that change? I mean, well, it, so I, I'll add the word positive, it, enable the acceleration of positive change. And, and what would the, that positive change be in your vision? Again, it goes to the, the overall modernization construct, but better data analysis, more uh, unified statewide data uh, collection and analysis. Um, What's better... stopping you from doing that now, that data collection? What, what would well, change about this? Historically, uh, the organizations have been on disparate and are today on disparate information technology systems. So. Uh, DMV, Fish and Wildlife, and State Police use different data collection methodology. We're working to change that as part of that modernization construct. Um, but that is an example of how that the existing level of fragmentation leads to um, fragmented decision making and fragmented platforms of operation, different policy, different supervision. Um, it's just, it, so we're kind of all say, over. Let's say you know there's a disparity. Once you have that data, what does it do to help you change that disparity? You're talking about disparity and outcomes relative to people that uh, law enforcement interacts with? Let's just say you, you have traffic stop data that shows that black males are disproportionately pulled over and searched in the state. Uh, <laughs> this really doesn't go to the agency construct other than the ability to take the experience and the work that's being done through the fair and impartial policing uh, team at the state police and superimpose it on the rest of state law enforcement. Um, I'm not sure we want to go into the, the nuances of, uh, of fair and impartial policing is that's, I mean, I'm happy to have that conversation with you, but I'm not sure this is the venue for that. So, what would you say is turning those is turning that trend around right now versus what you would do differently in an agency? Uh, probably not uh, communicating clearly. Um, 
What would be different with the agency is that you would have more stream, we'd, you'd have fewer, you'd have less fragmentation in the manner in which law enforcement personnel are hired, supervised, the types of policy, the accountability mechanisms, the data that's collected and analyzed, et cetera. And then that circle goes kind of back around. Um, all of those things are done a little bit differently across a number of different agencies. And to the extent that folks think, well, the, the state police is the superordinate agency, we're just gonna adopt what the state police does and make the other divisions, uh, in this case, there's only one contemplated, but in the future, if we were to have all four or five divisions uh, within the Department of Law Enforcement, that's not actually true. For example, uh, the Department of Liquor Control does an exceptional job at doing uh, data analysis. And we would take the, their experience and the talent that they've got doing that and work to superimpose that on the Department of Law Enforcement. And importantly, on the broader uh, agency of public safety, keep in mind that the, the Department of Law Enforcement is one piece of the larger public safety construct that you wanna be able to deliver great service uh, to Vermonters across the entire spectrum. So, um, that is, uh, it's, it's those kinds of, um, I keep coming back to the word modernizations, but those improvements in the operating environment where you can take uh, things that uh, the DMV enforcement team does well, things that liquor control does well, things that state police do well, like the fair and impartial policing work, and you take the best practice of all those things and you cross pollinate it uh, with consistency across the entire state law enforcement enterprise. That's the overarching goal. Okay. Um, I see that we are um, running out of time on this right now. I apologize to those of you who haven't had a chance to weigh in yet, but I would suggest that we will take this up, and I was trying to do next week's schedule, so we will take this up again next Wednesday, if that works for people. And, um, and what I'd like to do is have us look at the new draft and if that's the direction we wanna go and um, have people comment on that. And then as uh, John said, they don't have any um, opposition to the formation of an agency. They just don't wanna be part of it. So there, there are different conversations here. We're looking at the reorganization of a department into an agency that is simply a reorganization. The issues that currently um, are present in the department will, um, they'll, ex they'll exist whether it's a department or an agency and we have to deal with those other issues whether we do an agency or a department. And I, that probably wasn't very clear, but I see Tony has his hand up right now and then we're going to jump. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Tony Fakus, Director of Enforcement Safety for the record. Uh, if you want, I can hold off because I've got a lot to uh, unpackage uh, uh, here, um, you know, to respond uh, with some thoughts on everything I've heard so far. So if you want me to wait till Wednesday, I can certainly do that. I think so, because we had scheduled a, a walkthrough and I, we might have some guests uh, today to do the um, resolution, the eugenics resolution that was passed by the House. And I, I did see Michael Chernick here a minute ago. So um, if that's OK with you. Yes, Madam Chair, that's fine. OK, thank you. And um, so any last minute thoughts or questions or comments? before we jump. So we'll, everybody will get a, um, an invite to the next time we take this up. And um, if there are others that should also be invited, let us know, okay? Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So Michael, you are muted. No longer. 
Good afternoon, Madam Chair. Good afternoon. So thank you for joining us. And um, I have to say, I printed out the uh, resolution and I don't know if anybody else tried to print it out or not, but the type is so small, I can hardly see it. So <laughs> it, it's easier actually, Madam Chair, to look at it on the, uh, on our screen. <laughs> It, Gail has posted it, so it's easier just to pull it up and read it on, online. So, um, Michael, do you want to walk us through this? And um, I don't know that we'll have anybody else here today. I did think we had a chairs meeting at four, but that was canceled. So we don't have to, uh, excuse me, end at four, but um, we'll go through this as much as possible. And I don't know if Rick's whole rich Holshuk was going to join us or not. I did um, send him an invite in case he wanted to, but um, we will have more test. We'll he hear from other people on this next week also. So Michael, do you want to walk us through? I would be glad to. Uh, good afternoon, members of the committee. This is Michael Chernick. I am legislative counsel and I drafted this resolution, which has had a long history. And to begin, this resolution, of course, is the uh, eugenics apology resolution, JRH2. And the version that I'm going to review with you now is the version that passed the House a couple of weeks back. And I'll go through it. It's a joint resolution sincerely apologizing and expressing sorrow and regret to all individual Vermonters and their families and descendants who were harmed as a result of state sanctioned eugenics policies and practices recommends that the re and the committee rec uh, the house committee recommended that the resolution be amended by striking out the former version and this is the version that was adopted okay. so and now i'm going to go over each clause and i think what probably makes sense is for me to read it through yep. and then any questions madam chair you may have or members of the committee may have regarding the drafting as opposed remember i'm not here to speak yay or nay, but simply to explain what's there and to answer questions as to the technical language that is present as of right now. And with so my question, Michael, my question is, would you rather have, if people have questions about the language or not why or why not, but the language itself, would you rather have them ask as you go through each I'm whereas? I'm happy to do that if you all prefer. I'm saying indications oh. fine. I'll stop at each clause, and then if okay. I don't see any questions or raised hands, I will then move on to the next clause. Okay, I think that makes sense. Fine, fine. And so with that understanding, let us begin. Whereas state institutions established in the 19th century, including the Vermont State Hospital for the Insane and the Vermont Reform School became settings for the implementation of eugenics policies. And whereas in 1912, the intent of the General Assembly to develop policies that in later years would be identified as the practice of eugenics was manifested with the passage of the subsequently vetoed S-79 of 1912, an act to authorize and provide for the sterilization of imbeciles, feeble-minded and insane <laughs> persons, rapists, confirmed criminals, and other defectives and through the enactment of Acts and Resolves number 81 of 1912, an act to provide for the care, training, and education of feeble-minded children, the law authorizing the Brandon Training School, which opened in 1950. And whereas in 1925, University of Vermont zoology professor Henry F. Perkins established the Eugenic Survey of Vermont, with the participation of leaders within the Vermont state, gut within Vermont state government to collect evidence of Vermonters alleged delinquency, dependency, and deficiency. And whereas state, Michael, state I, yes. Yep. So okay. the, I think I tried to ask the house this, but I don't think I saw in there that it, it highlights that he was the president of the American Eugenic Survey. That, we just, that was not included in the house version. If you decided to include that in the Senate version, you certainly could. Did, was there like a reason that you feel comfortable? No one ever raised it. Okay. No one raised it. Okay. Okay. 
But if you want to, I, that's obviously your call completely. On my but list. just to tell you as a as a fact, it was never raised or discussed in committee. Okay. It was seen at, in committee enough the fact that he was a a, a full professor at UVM. Right. Right. Where uh, and with that, should I continue? Yes, please. Whereas state sanctioned eugenics policies targeted Vermonters of Native American Indian heritage, including French Indian and Abenaki families and persons of mixed ethnicity and of French Canadian heritage, as well as the poor and persons with disabilities, among others. And whereas in, S in 1927, S-59, an act related to voluntary eugenical sterilization passed the Senate, but was defeated in the House. And whereas the General Assembly adopted 1931 Acts and Resolves Number 174, an act for human betterment by voluntary sterilization for the purpose of eliminating from the future Vermont genetic pool persons deemed mentally unfit to procreate. And whereas Act 174 resulted in the sterilization of Vermonters and whether these individuals provided informed consent can be questioned. And whereas this state sanctioned eugenics policy was not an isolated example of oppression, but reflected the historic marginalization, discriminatory treatment, and displacement of these targeted groups in Vermont. Returning, moving to page three. And whereas eugenics advocates promoted sterilization for the protection of Vermont's old stock and to preserve the physical and social environment of Vermont for their children. And whereas the eugenics survey received assistance from state and municipal officials, individuals and private organizations, and the resulting sterilization, institutionalization, and separation policies intruded on the lives of its victims and had devastating and irreversible impacts that still persist in the lives of the targeted groups and especially the descendants of those who were directly impacted. And whereas in conducting the eugenics survey, the surveyors were granted access to case files from state agencies and institutions, and files were made available to persons of authority, including police departments, social workers, educators, and town officials. And whereas as a result of opening these files, children and adults were removed from families individuals were institutionalized or incarcerated, family connections were severed, and the sense of kinship, continuity, and community was lost. Now, therefore, Michael, being, yes. Sorry, <laughs> um, just getting the good part. But um, so I, I might raise this just with the committee itself, but a lot of that is in passive voice. It says people were removed, you know, things did happen to them. It doesn't name the agencies and institutions. That was intentional. There was a okay. lot of discussion back and forth. Uh, you may want to speak to Representative Kilkaki about it. Okay. It was viewed as historical and there were many, many versions of this. And this is what the committee agreed upon. Okay. So if you want to explore further the whys of certain language went in or out and the politics of it, you may want to have a conversation with Representative Kilkaki. We will. Thank you. And the passive was, it was intended, it was viewed as an historical, not a, a, a current tense. Uh, now, resolved by the Senate and House of Representatives that the General Assembly sincerely apologizes and expresses its sorrow and regret to all individual Vermonters and their families and descendants who were harmed as a result of state sanctioned eugenics policies and practices and be it further resolved that the General Assembly recognizes that further legislative action should be taken to address the continuing impact of state sanctioned eugenics policies and related practices of disenfranchisement, ethnocide, and genocide. And I will say that those, that those last terms, ethnocide and genocide, there was extensive conversation before those terms were ultimately selected. And that's the text that's passed the House. Thank you. Okay, yes, Senator Rahm. Um, did I miss something that highlighted how many women were sterilized? As no, there were no numbers. There was never any discussion of putting in specific numbers or percentages. Because to have those specific numbers, there's lots of different data out there that sometimes is in conflict. 
Okay. You may, as a possibility, say many or a, a large percentage or, or something of that nature. Do we have a, a notion, Michael? Michael, thank you for your work on this. I know it was a, a, a long and, and tough discussion in House General, so I appreciate your your work on this. Do we have a num notion of the number cumulatively of the people affected, just total in Vermont? Can we say like over 10, Probably 000? in the thousands is a safe assumption. How many? Certainly it, when all is said and done in the thousands and of course all the sterilizations were female. That goes about, uh, actually no, I'm not sure of that, but primarily. Okay. But they were in the thousands. We. Uh, the actual data, specific documented data with actual numbers is not necessarily present. There are lots of numbers that are floating around in different publications. Thank you. So any questions? I um, apologize. I didn't know how long the just the walkthrough would take. I should have um, scheduled some people to come in and and specifically testify on it, but I wanted us to all hear it first so that we could begin to absorb it. Um, are there any questions or comments for Michael? I mean, I don't know if it's for Michael, you know, but I, I will maybe talk to the committee a little bit before they come in or try to better understand context. It, frankly, just the way it reads, it feels like we're blaming a lot of buildings and one person for eugenics. It doesn't really name the people or institutions who were involved in the process. It says, here are the buildings where it happened and these are the people it happened to. So it feels strange to me in that way. Perhaps we can get that uh, when we speak with John Kalaki. Mm -hmm. As I, if I may, Madam Chair, and in response, I would recommend you have a long a conversation with Representative Kalaki. Uh, he there were decisions made in committee after multiple drafts and over a year of conversation. I'll just leave it at that. Right. Uh, it was a, a, a long path and many compromises is what I understand. So it'll be good to hear from Representative Kalaki. Yeah. I'll just say too, while it might not identify anyone specifically, uh, Senator Rahm, it does mention the legislature more than once. So there's certainly whoever was in the legislature in those years is identified. If I may, if I may in, uh, interject one thing, members of the committee, I can tell you that the committee was very focused on saying that the legislature was responsible and that the legislature is apologizing and all this happened because of the, uh, of the legislature adopting laws over the different years. And that was a, a prime focus of the House Committee. Because I believe we can only apologize for our own actions. Exactly. We, can we can't apologize for the actions of, of any, I mean, it says clearly about that there was received assistance from state municipal officials individuals and private organizations but we can't we can't apologize for municipalities or private organizations or individuals only for our own actions what about the state i i don't know that we can apologize for the actions of an administration we can only apologize for our own role and, and i might be mistaken but i don't know where that's written down but okay i mean that's a decision for all of you to make yeah and, and, and the legislature directed the state to do the thing. So in, in that capacity, Keisha, I think that, that, that it's on our back, you know, it's on, on us and therefore on us to apologize. I mean, so it doesn't say anything, Michael, about not providing the roles for many years, right? I mean, that was a lawsuit to get the information out of the state. Well, the, if I could, the existence of eugenics was obviously never a secret to begin with, obviously. It was there since the early 1900s. Mm -hmm. And this was focused primarily on the eugenics survey and sterilization. And no, there wasn't discussion of 
more contemporary legal action. It was basically focused on the legislature passed these laws. The legislature made a huge mistake. And now this is an attempt at a, a first attempt at a mea culpa on the part of the legislature. That was the committee's perspective. When you say first attempt, do you mean literally sure. or you're just referencing that there could be more apologies in the future? No, in terms of there being sub other substantive legislation, the House has been working on a more substantive. This is meant to be simply an expression of an apology, not any formal statutory action. And so there are other things happening, discussions happening in House General, to which if you note in that last slide, while the uh, whereas clause, while the legislature cannot bind a future legislature, that was also a quite a discussion in committee that the legis that the House version states the legislature realizes that other action should be taken in the future. And I, I think it's when I'm reading the resolve and it's pretty clear that it's the General Assembly that's apologizing for state sanctioned policies and practices and the legislature is the one that sanctioned those those policies and, and practices. So <clears throat> that's what we that's what we apologize for is our role in in these policies. I think so, so who would apologize for the state. I don't know. There could be a governor's, um, uh, an administ an executive. There could be a judicial apology. I don't know. But well, if I may, Madam Chair yeah. and Senator Rahm, by reading that resolve clause, there is. It's effectively, you could read it as it's effectively apologizing for the policies as, uh, as your chair stated that were legislatively uh, created. So it could it be is. read that way. That's for all of you to decide if you want to change that wording. But one way of reading it could be to the effect that it's apologizing for the policies themselves. As and well for as the practices. Action. It also says, and the practices. Yes, because we set the, I mean, the legislature set the policy and the administration carries out the policy in practice. I, I, I don't know if it's opaque why I'm asking these questions, but it is critical to understand that these are institutions that still exist. And this was a big part of their history and their foundation. This is the agency of human services. You know, this is the agency of education. So, you know, knowing what they were called at the time and what institutions, hospitals, agencies, departments carried this out, to me, names the entity th that caused the harm in addition to the legislature rather than acting like it was nameless, faceless, you know, invisible forces <laughs> that, that caused it to happen. If I may, Senator Rahm, the thought on the House Committee, and remember, I'm not here in any advocacy role, but simply a reporting role. The thought on the House Committee was that this, these were policies carried out throughout state government, and that all state government was effectively responsible, and not just one office or department. But again, you might want to pursue that further with the members of the House. Find out, I mean, we're, we're going to have John in, so. Yeah, and I, I, I mean, we can, we'll take some testimony on that and what, how, if we start to name state agencies, um, and I don't know, even know in 19, whatever, all, it was what they were called and if they were even comparable to what we have today um, and and institutions themselves if we I, I mean every every hospital that was in the state did they take part in the the practices um, I, I don't know where we would anyway we, we can have a discussion about that about how how specific we are in um, in naming 
I thought that they just saying that they were state sanctioned and that the state uh, received assistance from state and municipal officials, individuals and private organizations um, without having to name everybody was pretty clear, but we'll talk. Madam, about Chair, Madam Chair, as uh -huh. information for the committee, in one draft that was publicly released, so I can chat about it, there was, and this went through, as I said, many drafts as I'm looking on my worksheet here. Uh, there was mention that the Department of Social Welfare was established in 1923. And then in the end, the committee decided to remove that clause. Again, speak to Representative Kalaki as to why the committee decided to do that. Okay. Yep, we will. Okay, any more questions for Michael? And Senator Polina? This is, this is more of an interesting aside. Sure. But you notice that, <clears throat> excuse me, one of the first um, proposals that the General Assembly passed was vetoed by the governor, it says. And I just think that would be pretty interesting to see what the governor said in vetoing the first yeah. bill. <laughs> right. Uh, who was that, that governor? What, who was that governor? What did he I say? I can, give you, I can give you the reason why the veto occurred. Sure. Which, I hope it was a good I, thing. Uh, set, well, the attorney general had advised the governor, the attorney general at the time advised the governor that it was probably, un, or at least possibly unconstitutional, the 1912 yeah. legislation. And as a consequence, the governor decided that he wasn't going to open himself and the state up to a court suit. And, and why was there no court action, right? At, at when, when it was, when things did finally go through? That was the poly, the poly, the uh, like one can say the the environment of the time. The very different world in 1931 than in 2021. In some ways, yeah. Oh, by the way, the governor of Vermont in 1912 was John Mead. Who? Mead. John Mead. M E A D. I would love to get a historian in and, and better understand the dissenting voices of the time. Maybe they had a completely ignoble reason for dissenting, but I'd be very curious. Who would, do you know who that would be, Michael? Yes, I do. Uh, the House Committee spent a lot of time with this book. Uh, oh, yeah, Nancy's book. Right, Nancy's book. Yeah. And Nancy was in committee point. more than once. Yeah. And this became a prime source in my writing into committee discussion. Right. So you may want to hear from Nancy Gallagher. Okay. okay. Good. Okay, well, great. It's well drafted, thank you. All right. So any other questions or comments? And then we'll take this up again next week. Great. Thank you, Michael, very much. Good. Thanks, Good Thanks Michael. Miss seeing you in person. Yes, but it's nice to see you're in your office. I know, missing the office. <laughs> well, we all miss being in person. Let's hope. Yeah, we do. The next January. <laughs> <laughs>